right, welcome to the presentation. Uh, this is Totenkopf. Uh, she has studied for four years to be a forensic psychologist uh, before turning to the dark side. <laughs> at, at last year's Nauticon, she met Neil Rain and a bend, and after listening to several of their conversations and partaking in a few, she's become interested in the idea of neurohacking. This is her first of hopefully many neurohacking talks. The idea came about while trying to think of ways that she could perform certain cognitive processes more efficiently with minimal long-term effects. Yep. Um, this is more about, um, well, first of all, yeah. So we're talking about hacking cognition, and um, what we'll be covering <laughs> is an introduction in the mind-body problem, distributed processing, cortical systems and association cortices, cognition and cognitive processing, nootropics or smart drugs, and the pros and cons of using smart drugs. Okay, um, hacking cognition is um, using smart drugs to um, enhance cognitive functions, even though it cut off. Um, it's important to know what functions you want to work on, the parts of the brain that control these functions, and the side effects associated with doing so. I'm a huge advocate of finding out everything you can about your body before you decide to break something or make it better. So the mind, <clears throat> the mind body problem is um, started with Plato, who believed that the mind is separate from the body and is capable of maintaining existence without it. Aristotle, however, felt that the body and soul were two halves of the same underlying substance, which is form and matter. Um, the enduring question is, what is the nature of the mind and mental process, and how or even if minds are affected, and, or affected by and can be affected or, and can affect the body? <clears throat> um, perceptual experiences depend on somatosensory stimuli, like somebody touching your hand, um, the wind blowing your hair, a smell. The, these stimuli cause changes in our mental states, ultimately causing us to feel a sensation which may be pleasant or unpleasant. Um, one of the main questions is, how can it be possible for conscious experiences to arise out of a lump of gray matter endowed with nothing but electrochemical properties? Basically, they want to figure out, how do you go from thinking about a slice of pizza to getting up and going to get it? Okay, now we're talking about where cognitive processing occurs. Um, there used to be two schools of thoughts. Um, the phrenologists believe that all cognitive abilities and personality traits are controlled by specific parts of the brain. Um, this was discarded because they didn't follow certain rigorous scientific methods to back up their beliefs. Then there was the holistic view, who believed that um, functions and traits can only be localized to the cerebral cortex and they function as a whole, with any part able to substitute for the function of another. So who is right? Well, um, neither, but they're both technically right. Um, distributed processing is a combination of phrenology and holistic views. Scientists now believe that sensory systems carry out a lot of processing by the system itself, but still depends on everything being interconnected in the cerebral cortex. Now, I know a lot what um, some of you may be thinking. <laughs> and it's actually really simple. Imagine that the brain is a cluster of generators represented by P, and the cerebral cortex is the control center. So when one of the generators fail, the cerebral cortex is unable to send power or information to the system. When this happens, it sends more power to the other working generators so that they can try to compensate for the lost function. Um, it helps to explain how those who have vision problems have increased um, senses of sight or of um, smell and hearing. Okay, time for a history of distributed processing. In 1861, Pierre Paul Broca had a patient who could understand language and comprehend words, but he couldn't speak. 
um, post-mortem examination of the patient's brain showed a lesion in the back part of his brain, or back part of the frontal lobe, which is now called the Broca's area. In 1876, Carl Wernicke had a patient who had problems understanding languages, but um, he had no problems with hearing. Like, he could respond to um, his name in simple commands, and he could speak, but he couldn't understand somebody trying to um, converse with him. All right, this is a picture of your brain. Um, in the front, you can see Broca's area. In the back is Wernicke, uh, Wernicke's area. Wernicke believed that the simplest mental functions, perception and um, motor areas of the brain, were confined to, center, or to certain cortical areas, but um, there were interconnections between them that made more complex functions possible. His studies were the first evidence of distributed processing, which is um, now the accepted belief pertaining to brain function. Okay, cortical systems. There's three levels. Um, cortical systems can be classified on the basis of the functions they participate in, separated, in, well, like I said, into three levels. The first deals with primary sensory cortices, where the information first arrives at the, at the cortical level. The second level is the higher order, or higher order sensory cortices. And the third level is the association cortices. <clears throat> the, anatomical, or the anatomical basis for thought and perception is believed to be at the association cortices. Stimulation of these areas produce little to no obvious changes in behavior. Um, you, it receives sensory input from high order, um, high order sensory systems and project to the motor cortex. So basically, what you feel on your skin automatically goes to um, your higher order sensory systems. Um, there are three identified association areas of the cortex, which is um, the prefrontal association cortex, the limbic association cortex, and the parietal temporal occipital association co cortex. Okay, the prefrontal association cortex occupies most of the rostral part of the frontal lobe. It's important um, to plan voluntary movement like swinging your legs while on a swing. And it's believed to control several cognitive behaviors, including premeditated behavior. The limbic association cortex deals with motivation, emotion, and memory. It's located um, in the middle and back surfaces of the cerebral hemispheres in the portions of the parietal and temporal and frontal lobes. And the parietal temporal occipital associative or association cortex processes somatosensory data from the skin, muscles, tendons, joints, as well as those related to body posture and movements. Um, the integration of this information allows us to formulate a conscious thought about the precise position of our body, whether it's moving or not. Information from these different sensory areas combine to form complex perceptions, including the ability to understand language. All right, now on to cognition and cognitive processes. Cognition is defined as the process or processes by which an organism gains knowledge or becomes aware of events or objects in its environment and uses that knowledge for comprehension and problem solving. <clears throat> cognitive psychology refers to the information processing view of an individual's cognitive functions. Basically, it means um, how they study the processing of information that can be detected by an observer using devices such as an EEG or MRI. It can be credited to Thomas Aquinas, who believed that the study of behavior is categorized to either cognitive, how we know the world, and effect, which is feelings and emotions. And it affects, um, and the effects of smart drugs on the brain and its processes are included in this field. Examples of cognitive functions include, but are not limited to, um, memory, learning and comprehension, attention, 
mood, alertness, behavior, and self-monitoring processes or regulation processes. Um, these include those that are um, responsible for involuntary actions like the rise and fall of your chest while you breathe. Time for a public service announcement before, oh, it does, oh, hold on. We're not getting any sound. windows. Wait. Yeah. Sorry about this. for danger. Doc! Never take medicine without a grown-up present. You could do more harm than good. What should we do? If you can, wait for your parents. Or if it's serious, ask a neighbor for help. Hey, Mom's home. Now you'll get help. And now we know what to do next time. And knowing is half the battle. G.I. Joe! Now we're talking about smart drugs. Um, we will go over the more popular smart drugs for some of the cognitive functions mentioned earlier. Um, the asterisk after a drug name means that it is legal to use these substances in the US, but you can't get them without a prescription within the US. You can get them in Mexico and Switzerland. <laughs> All right, we'll start with um, memory. Um, the drug is hydrogene. Um, too large of a dose um, can cause a, a nausea, gastric disturbance, or headache. Overall, hydrogen does not produce any serious side effects. It's non-toxic even if you exceed the recommended dose. Um, and it is contraindicated only for individuals who have chronic or acute psychosis. So if you're crazy, don't take hydrogen. The U.S. recommended dosage is three milligrams a day. However, um, the European recommended dosage is nine milligrams a day taken in three individual doses. It may take several weeks or even months before hydrogen produces noticeable effects. And hydrogen, but not its generic counterparts, is available in a sublingual form. And there's evidence that sublingual doses reach the brain in greater quantity. For learning and comprehension, there's DMAE. I can't pronounce that long word, but it's DMAE. Um, studies in which participants took high doses of DMAE haven't really revealed any harmful side effects, although one study published in 1979 linked DMAE with depression and moderate symptoms of mania. Dosages haven't been looked into too much, but pills are usually sold in 125 milligram tablets. It's a precursor of choline and an antioxidant that is found naturally in the brain. And most people who use DMAE supplements report that after three to four weeks of using it, um, they have a continual mild stimulation of their CNS without um, side effects. Um, CNS being your central nervous system, in case you didn't know that. 
Um, for attention and concentration, there's paracetam. Um, it can increase the effects of certain drugs, such as amphetamines and psychotropics. Adverse effects are rare, but include insomnia, psychomotor ag agitation, nausea, headaches, and an upset stomach. Um, it's supplied in 400 or 800 milligram tablets. Usual dose is 2,400 to 48 milligrams a day in three doses. Um, when some people first take paracetam, they do not notice any effect until they take a higher dose. Um, after that, it's, they notice um, that a lower dose is just fine enough and the drug takes effect in about half an hour to an hour. Um, for mood, there's St. John's wort. Um, it's generally well tolerated. Its um, ad most adverse effect um, is similar to a placebo effect. The most common adverse effects include um, upset stomach, dizziness, confusion, tiredness, and sedation. Um, hair loss has also been noticed. St. John's wort may rarely lead to visual sensitivity to light and to sunburns in situations that usually wouldn't cause them. Suggested dosage is 200 to 1,000 milligrams. Um, start at the lower dosage and work your way up. Discontinue if there are any apparent side effects. Do not use if you're taking any antidepressants or antipsychotic medications without consulting your physician first. For alertness, there's vasopressin. Um, it occasionally causes runny nose, nasal congestion, irritation of the nasal passages, headache, abdominal cramps, increased bowel movements. Angina sufferers should not use vasopressin since it can trigger angina pains. And it has um, not been proven to be safe for use during pregnancy. It usually comes in a nasal spray bottle. Most studies showing memory improvements have been done with the dose of 12 to 16 USP per day, which is one NIF in each nostril three to four times a day. Vasopressin produces a noticeable effect within seconds because it's not in a pill form. Obtaining no, um, nootropics that are not over-the-counter in the United States. One reason some of these substances are not available in the U.S. is that they have not yet gone through the extraordinarily expensive and lengthy process required to obtain FDA approval. Um, in April 1982, an issue of the FDA Drug Bulletin included a policy statement clarifying the question of unapproved uses for drugs. This bulletin clearly states that unapproved uses may be appropriate and rational in certain circumstances, and um, it may reflect approaches to drug therapy that have been um, extensively reported in medical literature. Um, in July of 1989, um, FDA made a ruling that now makes it legal to import effective drugs used elsewhere but not available in the United States without a prescription. <clears throat> um, they allow the importation and mail shipment of a three-month supply of drugs for personal use as long as they are regarded as safe in other countries. Um, FDA pilot guidelines, Chapter 971, stated that um, basically um, reinforced what the previous two bullet points said, but it was as a result of heavy pressure from AIDS political action groups, which insisted AIDS sufferers were denied access to potentially life-saving substances that were widely used abroad, but were still unapproved for use in the U.S. All right, the pros and cons of new tropics. It removes lipofusin, which is um, a finely granular yellow-brown pigment um, composed of lipid-containing lipid resi residues um, of lysosomal digestion. Um, it's found in the liver, kidney, heart muscle, adrenals, nerve cells, and ganglion cells. Um, it appears to be the product of oxidation of unsaturated fatty acids and may be symptomatic of membrane damage or damage to the mitochondria and lysosomes. Um, another pro of nootropics is it's getting less costly over time. 
and substances improve learning, memory consolidation, and memory retrieval without other central nervous effects and with low toxicity, even at extremely high doses. Um, the cons, availability in the U.S. is limited. Side effects from um, consistent long-term use are still unknown. It's argued that distractibility is good for creativity. It widens the educational gap between the richer students and the poorer ones for those smart drugs that are still really expensive. And smart drugs have the potential to alter the core of a person's identity by significantly changing their personality. And that's it. I did have caffeinated pixie sticks, but it was more of a pain than I realized it was going to be. <laughs> because what you have to do is ground up, no dose, um, yeah, no dose um, pills, vitamin B energy complex pills, and then get them in a straw with pixie sticks. <laughs> I'll try to have them tomorrow, though. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Is it on? Oh, is, is Ritalin a nootropic type of drug? Yes. And, and what do you think about the pros and cons of, of using that? Because in schools, sometimes it's used for either reducing hyperactivity or improving focus, and it's expensive too, right? Right. Um, Ritalin is considered a smart drug. Um, I will admit that I have used it a couple of times while studying for finals, and it does help with um, making me more focused. Uh, a nootropic is a um, smart drug. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I don't think I want to answer Shardy's question. I'm <laughs> uh, just wondering, uh, how do you feel about drugs like modafinil and related ones? Um, modafinil? Uh, Provigil, uh, anti-narcolepsy, commonly used, keeps you awake, no side effects. Um, I haven't that used that. them, and um, I honestly should, haven't You should done. look into that one. It's, it's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly haven't used it, so I don't know uh, much about it, unfortunately. Sorry, Shardy. Um, you said the ones listed there with the STAR are required, required prescription? Uh, right. The um, drugs with the asterisk next to the names do require prescription in the Because I've gotten like DMA at GNC before it's I've picked it. Well, it's, it depends. Um, actually, the ones in GN, um, available in GNC are completely different from um, some of the ones that are offered in Switzerland and Mexico. Um, I guess it's higher dosages than what um, they're allowed to sell at GNC. And now do most of them have to be metabolized or can you just, I mean, because they're not like Ritalin, you don't have to. But I'm sorry, what? Do most of them have to be metabolized? Yeah, unfortunately most of them do. Any others? Abe? So some of them, you said, took effect in 30 to 60 minutes right after you ate them, right after you shot it up your nose, and then others took months. What's the cause of the uh, delay? Um, honestly, I think it's um, the way that it's processed by the body. Also, it um, has to do with the dosages. So why not just eat like a quarter cup of it? And <laughs> I mean, you know, when it dropped you want, you off the dose, that? as Terrence McKenna, I think, said. We can make a game out of it. We can each take like half a cup of pills each. <laughs> I think that game is called Russian Roulette. <laughs> so say I wanted to go to a doctor and get some of these smart drugs. What should I say? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm about to show that picture if you're not nice to me. <laughs> I'm not suggesting going to a if doctor and pretending doctor to have to a disease drugs. you don't have. But what should I say? Well, you don't necessarily have to go to a doctor to get these. Um, there's a place in Switzerland that I know of um, where you can... By a place, you mean there's this guy? What, what about Canadian pharmacies? <laughs> well, huh? Canadian pharmacies, I get all these emails. Oh, well, you guys are Kanukistanis. I don't know what you guys do up there. <laughs> Go ahead. Here, we have one back here. 
Yes. Yeah, I had a question. I missed the very first part of the presentation, but how many of these uh, different drugs have been tested uh, using peer-reviewed methods and multiple tests that actually showed them to be effective? Um, to I see a lot of supplements on the market that they kind of throw out there and say it does this, and they have anecdotal evidence that it does this, but when it, they do actual peer-reviewed journal research, there's very little that it actually does that they can confirm. How many of these drugs are actually have gone through multiple tests from different firms to guarantee that they are doing what they say they do? Well, there's a lot of studies, um, mostly found in medical journals, um, regarding different drugs like um, vasopressin and paracetam that um, prove their effectiveness. Um, it's just that either they can't afford to go through the rigorous testing that the FDA requires, or um, the FDA doesn't think that it will work for whatever reason they believe. But like I said in the presentation, it does, um, the FDA does allow us to ship three months supply of worth of medicine from elsewhere as long as they're considered um, safe in other countries. Anything else? And just for reference, a lot of this stuff is available over the counter in Mexico. So if exactly, over down, the counter in Mexico, you know, happens to be in a foreign country, in you can bring back a three or six month supply as well. Um, and scientific studies have been done on like provigonal and some of this stuff, sure. Um, and there's some other experimental ones. Uh, so any other questions? We have plenty of time. Don't you guys want to be smart? All right, thank you. <laughs> What's in this?